start out, we're going to show you uh, kind of the Clio evolution. Um, now, I'm kind of the, you can kind of divide it like I'm the body, he's the brain. I mean, it's a crude thing, but it's, that's kind of how we're going to talk about this. I'll talk about from the, the physical design side, and John is going to go into a lot more detail in the, uh, on the inside. Um, so, the first question is, well, let's see, what did I start with? I can't remember okay, this is what I was going to start with. Um, Kind of our philosophy of, of design is uh, combining art and science. Um, and I know a lot of people have talked about that, and, and I'm hoping that uh, through you, Gobi, and through our products, we kind of have a realization of, of, of this mixing. But I tried to come up with what, how, to, how to present this blend. And what I came up with is, is this kind of dynamic balance thing where art and science are, are always uh, interacting with each other. Art is the, uh, is the human side, it's the emotion side, it's the uh, why you do something, and science is, is how you do something. And uh, I think we're, this field is exploding now and growing because we've added the art to the science, you know, it's all the human stuff. Um, it's like data getting the emotion show. So what we're doing is we're, we're blending these things and, and between those you get this, this kind of explosion of innovation that either the, the technologist or the artist would, or the designer would find individually. Now, in, in my mind, you need one more thing. Uh, you can create great innovation with this, but you don't get a lot of traction in the world. We were just having a discussion about uh, um, Xerox Park versus Apple. You know, Xerox Park, I think, did you know, phenomenal in, 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 in finding innovation, but they, I think you need the traction of business around it. So these are the three elements, I think, that make a successful enterprise. Um, or to get your innovation out there, you need to take your seed of innovation, plant it in the, in the soil of business. And when those three people are sitting at the table and they, Decided to put business together, I think that's when you get a company like Ugobi. And uh, other companies might be like Pixar or Apple. Mean, they, they really do a good job of blending all these things. So that's uh, just the little philosophy part. So a dinosaur. We decided, uh, I decided years ago that I liked dinosaurs for whatever reason. Um, and uh, it was a Mattel and I was doing dinosaurs and, and creatures of all kinds. This was before Furby. And the reason a dinosaur is because you can't have a dinosaur as a pet. You, you know, you can have a cat or a dog. And, and, uh, uh, and why duplicate something you can already have? Also, of course, if you make a cat or a dog, you're going to make a really bad cat or a dog. Uh, and if you do a dinosaur, well, you don't have a lot to compare to, so that really helps you out. And then also, <laughs> so, yeah, they look exactly like this. But in doing a dinosaur, um, it's also, if you think of a brand, um, I used to get Mattel and brands were important, so dinosaur as a brand, it's a, it's a free license, plus you have uh, one of the big challenges in doing a, a product like this is you don't want to be perceived or in reality be a toy company. You really want to be a technology company doing toys. And the reason is the valuation of toys, the business elements with, with toy companies are very slow. The multipliers are very low. So you, if you were going to start an enterprise and get funding and all that, you never start out in toys because then you just you limit your world. You want to start out high. So, and in fact, that's really what we had to do anyway to pull this off. So it was a, a dinosaur. And then what dinosaur was, I, I picked a Camarasaurus because they were uh, the most populous uh, sauropod in North America, and we could find full fossil e evidence. Plus, they had a really big head. Now imagine this was a different dinosaur. It had those little pencil heads. There'd be no expression left. There'd be no room for motors. It wouldn't have big eyes. So you really, we in every uh, in every design aspect of picking an animal and, and figuring out how to animate them, we always look to technology and what is possible today, and, and overlay those two. Because if we try to do like a cat. Or, 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 or a cheetah, you know, we can't run that fast, the batteries would die, you know, there's all these matrices that you put together and you come up with, a, come up with, with the right animal. So these are just uh, images of, of, of baby dinos. And, and the other thing was most people when they think of a dinosaur, they think of an adult dinosaur. So almost everyone I've ever talked to when we were pitching this product, oh, well, dinosaurs are for boys. Because they're thinking I'm going to do like an apatosaurus or something and scale down to this size. I wanted to make it a real character, so you want to remove that level of abstraction and make it a one-to-one -one scale. So you can say, this is how big they were. This is a two-week-old. That really makes it much different than saying, oh, I'm going to play with my little caveman with this giant dinosaur that's not real, obviously, because he's a model of a big one. So, so there, was, there was some thought along those little signs, too. So here's uh, the body, and uh, you might call this kind of biomimicry, but, uh, but what I wanted to do was, is well, first of all, this is like one of the few um, animals, like I said, that has a full skeletal remains. You could actually go and uh, measure the uh, 
measure the body. This is actually sauropod skin from, uh, from Patagonia. There was a book called Walking on Eggshells, and they actually found fossilized uh, sauropod skin. So this is also, this whole thing is the story of an obsession. Um, it, when, when, I, when we decided to do dinosaurs, people are, the people that love dinosaurs care about detail. I mean, it was a real animal. There's fossil evidence. So part of the brand, if you will, or part of the wonder or magic of doing this is to try to be as accurate as you can. How do we clone a dinosaur? And that was, a, it was an impossible dream, but I think actually impossible dreams are much easier to fund than, than, than middle of the road dreams. So it's true. You get great people who go, ah, oh, I have to try to do that. So um, I'm going wrong. So there's the animal, um, and we sh I shortened the legs and the head a little bit, but pretty much those are the proportions. And then I went, and, you know, what do I want? I measure the dinosaur, and I say these are the, uh, this is geometry. And then what do I want? I start to build it. So I start, this is how I start. I do a, you know, <coughs> I start putting the motors where they can go. Um, another really important part in this was um, the thing that stopped a lot of people from doing robotics, and, and still does, is, is uh, balance and gait. So uh, if you have a quadruped and you want to get a walk, actually no one had really done it successfully until Sony did that robot dog, Ivo. And then when it walks, it kind of walks one leg at a time. It doesn't really walk like an animal, because a real animal, the hips are always moving. It's very complicated math to do. And, um, and then to stay in balance and actually not moonwalk, but actually have traction when the other feet are off the ground. So it's, uh, it's actually pretty complicated to do. So we did a test early on. Uh, and the test was, let's see if we can make a little robot with four legs and try out this new way of animating uh, a walker. This is the first robotic test. It took us uh, about um, a month to build all this and about a day of programming. That's going to stretch. But right away you see the, the um, coordinated gesture. All nine motors, motors will be at the same time, at different speeds, at different, in different directions. And you can see he's in balance, which is balancing on two feet. This is just playing back from, from, from a laptop. But, um, but as soon as you can control the motors with this kind of finesse, you can actually have a hope of doing emotions. Because the whole reason to do a, an animal like this is to be able to convey emotions for me. Because if you can create an emotional bond, like a pet does, then, then you've got the user for much longer than, than you know, like a toy or something. So this was our first attempt at walking gate. We, we, right away it, it worked. What's nice is with the offering system, we can change this gate in, in, uh, in a couple hours uh, and make a sneaky walk. Well, and have our ego was this kind of baby dino to be able to convey emotions through its movements. Here, for example, is its response to a loud sound. And you hear a loud sound. And it's shaking with fear, kind of. It's shaking with fear. <laughs> Here is how the baby guy would look in a playful mood. We decided to put a spine in just for this so we could get more uh, physicality in body. And here is a curious look for the baby guy exploring over a wall. Understands what's going on. That's why it flourishes the way we made it here. So 